Um, it's actually not Browser Mob anymore. It's Newstar, which is one of the uh, uh, sponsors of this conference. Um, and I wanted to just take a few minutes here. I, I don't want to. I know we're running a little late, so I don't want to hold up uh, Tim's presentation. I know we're pretty excited about that. Um, but I want to take a few minutes to kind of share my personal story in using cloud computing and some of the you know techniques and, and things that I've learned at Velocity conferences in the past, uh, and that are being taught in the conference this year. Uh, around operational excellence, scaling, performance, but also some of the things I learned in terms of the finance and the business model of how I started my, my company, Browser Mob, and, uh, and what I learned along the way and, and how it ultimately resulted in, in, a, in a positive outcome and, uh, and me ending up joining uh, Newstar. So um, as I was kind of searching, let's see if this clicked through. There we go. So as I was searching for um, a way to describe Browser Mob, I came across this shirt, and I'll tell you why, why I came across it. I, I, I would tell people Browser Mob is kind of like taking a sledgehammer to a fly. And then I was like, well, is the phrase to a fly, or is it to crack a walnut, or to kill an ant? I couldn't remember the phrase. So like any good nerd, I searched Google and ranked them up and said, which one has the most, uh, which phrase has the most search results? And then I randomly stumbled into this shirt by the US Marines. And if you can't read it, it says, sometimes it's entirely appropriate to kill a fly with a sledgehammer. And I thought that was pretty funny, and I thought that actually would have been a great shirt for browser mob. And we might still use it, because I could have just as easily slapped on the browser mob logo there because that's really what our business was doing um, and is doing today. Uh, it's a cloud load testing service, and I'll get a little more into what it does here in a second, but uh, basically it, uh, it used the Amazon cloud and other cloud networks to generate uh, a ton of traffic to you know, overload your site and tell you where your scalability problems were. Uh, but a few quick statistics about us and kind of where we came from. So, uh, the business was entirely bootstrapped, uh, grown and raised in Portland, Oregon, so not exactly the you know, startup hub of the world. Um, and in, in the idea came around in September 2008, uh, and the first product was launched in December. So in just about two months, we were able to put something together and get it out. Uh, less than a year later, we rolled out our second product. In addition to load testing, we were then doing website monitoring. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room use some of these website monitoring tools that are out there. Um, and less than a year after that, we were acquired. And along the way, we remained very small, three employees and over 500 uh, customers, and yet we were profitable in the first month. And pretty much all of that was only possible due to the cloud. So I wanted to share just a few lessons that I learned personally uh, and see if it helps anyone else in this room or might be a familiar story. And, and I think it may end up being somewhat of a, a prototypical example for future startups, uh, how they can learn to focus maniacally on their core business and outsource everything else. So Theo this morning mentioned, uh, mentioned actually that you know, we're all in the web operations space and that's no more true than when you're a three-person startup or uh, early on when it's a one-person startup. You know, I was uh, not only in the operations business, I was in the finance business, I was also in the janitorial business, I was in every business that you could possibly be when you're a one-person startup. Um, and what I was set out to build was primarily a load testing service that used real browsers to drive the traffic. And that's where the sledgehammer comes in because it's kind of ridiculous that you would spin up two or 3,000 CPU cores in the Amazon network just to overload one or two web servers. But I looked at the math and I started thinking, well, if, it, if I gotta pay a guy $100 to really work out that JMeter script and understand all that crazy JSON that's going back and forth across the wire, and it takes him 10 or 20 hours to write that load test script, but he could write a, a Selenium script in 30 minutes, why not spin up a ton of machines? Why not take advantage of the cloud and just use Selenium to, to overload it. Of course you could generate traffic in a more efficient manner, but can you build the script and get interesting reports out of it? And that was the core thesis of the business. Um, and the, the finance model of it really started to kind of gel for me as I was thinking about it in 2008. Um, you know, I realized that I could probably charge a dollar for a, a browser per hour, and yet I was only paying eight and a half cents to Amazon plus a little bit extra for bandwidth. So hey, I've got good, good uh, profit model. I also realized that the metered model of cloud computing allowed me to have a pretty accurate financial model. And that was, that was really kind of just a big eye-opening experience for me. I'm sure you know, a lot of people here are growing saying, duh. But you know, for me, I was used to a business model where you know, you've got kind of two ends of guesswork. You, you know, you're kind of just making up, oh yeah, our sales will grow 
30% month over month for the first six months. And then also kind of guessing how many servers I needed and how much my, my operational cost would be. And yet with the cloud and the metered model, I could say exactly what I knew and tie it directly back uh, to, you know, what I knew in terms of the architecture and tie it right back to my cost model. And so that was a huge, huge, uh, you know, surprise for me. Um, and so it made, me, it made my finance model and my kind of business plan much more predictable and, and easy to follow along. Uh, and then everything else I just outsourced. My, my belief was we've got to focus on load testing. And whether it's finances with QuickBooks or email with Google Apps or code hosting with GitHub, I was just going to put all of that out there and have someone else do it for me. That doesn't mean I couldn't worry about it. And we spent a lot of time, I'll get to in just a second, on the operational side of using Amazon and other cloud computing networks. But it did mean that I didn't have to build it from scratch. And that's really the power of the, the cloud at the end of the day. So the second lesson that I learned is, there we go, is, uh, is all, all about optimizing for the cloud. So right off the bat, I, I discovered the myth, and I kind of dis discovered it in a big failure, uh, that the cloud is not infinitely scalable. My original business plan just said, oh, yeah, I'm going to spin up 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 machines. It'll be no big deal. And obviously, that's crazy talk. Um, I don't know if the limit's still 20 or not, but Amazon EC2 uh, at the time was limiting customers to 20 instances. Uh, and so I kind of ran into that with my first paying customer who tried running a test that required a couple hundred instances. And uh, we kind of just failed flat uh, and fell right on our face. Um, and yet through some, some you know, in intensive technical work, uh, as well as uh, you know, schmoozing and, uh, and just chatting with the folks at Amazon and, and helping them understand our business. That was actually the key thing, working very closely with them, being a good cloud citizen and, and helping them know what we're up to and giving them confidence that there was a real business model behind this. Uh, they've worked with us so that we now spin up thousands of EC2 instances almost every day. Um, and in some cases, you know, maybe right now, we may have more instances than Netflix is running at any given moment. Now, the big difference is we shut them down an hour later, but uh, we're, we're bringing these machines up and down, and we've worked closely with Amazon. And so, you know, if you're going to work with any cloud vendor, the lesson there was don't just treat it like a black box. You've got to know what you're, work, you're working on technically, but also work with the people that are there. It's, it's very important. Um, Benchmarking, of course you've got to benchmark it. In our case, the instance types were the critical thing, but whether it's a database or a queue system, benchmark it. Uh, anyone who's done testing of an M1 small versus a C1 medium knows exactly what I'm talking about. There are massive, massive differences there. And so we learned, uh, we learned sometimes the hard way that that was uh, critically important. Uh, and then finally, the, the profit model you know, really depended on the architecture. As, as I had an Excel spreadsheet trying to describe out what my profits, my gross margins would be, and, and all of that, it, it, you know, I realized I had to know what my architecture looked like. Because if I was going to be transferring data from one S3 region across to a different EC2 location, I was paying for bandwidth. And so I found, in some cases, many cases, it was much cheaper to pay for the storage and duplicate the data in local areas where the transfer between S3 and EC2 within the same region is free than to incur the bandwidth costs. And so that was, uh, that was definitely something that, uh, that I learned along the way, that in a world of cloud where there's this very strict metered model, your architecture can influence your business plan pretty significantly. Um, uh, also, AMIs, um, you know, the machine images themselves, very, very painful to create. And so we learned pretty early on that uh, using them like stem cells was actually pretty important, where we'd have a base image, spin it up, and then sort of customize it as it, as it loads up. And of course, there's all sorts of uh, interesting innovation going on in the last couple of years in that space of provisioning machines. The, the next lesson I learned uh, was all about processing data. Um, you know, the worst thing that, I, that we could have done was to solve the wrong problem with the wrong product. And so in our case, we were maniacally focused on a self-service load testing product. And yet we had some great competitors who were doing a ton more uh, in, the, in the analytics space, diving really deep on the data set that they were collecting and showing all the reports, uh, giving you know, a million ways to slice and dice the data. And we had like two lousy charts. And so I was tempted for a little while to go and you know, do what they were doing. But I realized that I've got to you know, focus on my core business. And, it was a, and, and so I kind of looked for ways to, to use the cloud to my benefit. And we ended up with this really, really simple solution. It's kind of silly looking if you've actually used our product, where we spin up a MySQL database. And for every load test a customer runs with us, 
they get their own dedicated MySQL database, it's in EC2, and we dump all the data in there. And then we give them a little text window where we say, write your SQL queries. And it looks like the biggest SQL injection hack in the world, uh, but it's actually by design. We're letting our customers interact with a dedicated database. And that's something that really you could only do with virtualization because of the sandboxing that's there. Um, so we, we definitely learned that how we store our data can influence kind of how our business evolves and where we spend our focus and, and allowed us to kind of stay focused. At the same time, we needed to build the right product and build it the right way. If we built it incorrectly, particularly around data storage, it could have been really dangerous for us. So one thing we also learned is for a short period of time, why not experiment, fail fast, store data in two or three or four different types of data storage mechanisms and see which one works for us. So we actually experimented with uh, at least simple DB, Amazon RDS, um, our own hosted our, uh, MySQL, as well as storing flat files, HAR files in S3, all concurrently and then pick the winner. So we actually screwed up twice or three times before we finally picked the winner, but because the cloud allowed us to kind of just provision up a machine for a month or two and then bring it back down, it let us experiment. If we were doing kind of a, a model where we had to go and invest heavy capital and then decided, oops, we picked the wrong technology, that would have been a much more difficult problem for us. Um, so the last lesson I think is actually the most critical one, and it, and it kind of speaks again to, to Theo's point this morning around how we're all in the operations game. And that's learning how to sleep well at night or alternatively to go out on a date night with your wife after you've been working 80 hours a week uh, or you know, anything else that detaches you from the computer. When you're a startup, you know, if your site goes offline when your three sole employees are all asleep, you know, that can ruin your reputation forever. And so we needed to make sure that we were able to be comfortable with the site staying alive or, or waking us up when we went offline. So of course we monitored everything. We used Browser Mob to monitor ourselves, but we also had to watch Browser Mob and monitor the monitor. And in that case, we actually used uh, a small little program we wrote that, uh, that actually used Twilio. Twilio is a fantastic telephony uh, service out there, API, total cloud-based system that allows you to initiate phone calls. And we wrote that program to, to spin up uh, um, a, a phone call and wake us up because even the lightest sleepers are gonna sleep through a text message. All it takes is once and you could totally screw up your company. And, uh, and so we had this system that would kind of cycle through and wake up the next team member um, although the guy is actually sitting here somewhere in this room, the guy who wrote it on my team was, uh, he wrote it in such a way that after the system restarted, whenever we did a new deployment, it would always reset the counter back to me as the first person to get called. And I think he did that by design, but uh, um, you know, I didn't mind because the reality is, is if you get pulled out of bed every time something goes wrong, you can almost plot it on a chart the number of things that go wrong are gonna to go to zero very quickly. And that's you know, just one more compelling case of why we've gotta just remove that line between developers and operations. Um, of course, we also auto-healed everything that we could possibly do. With our monitoring system, we took advantage of queuing, uh, wa um, watched the queue sizes, spun up additional machines in locations for our monitoring network that we didn't have uh, elastic capacity. We would spin up machines in the elastic locations and take them off the queues, and so that reduced the phone calls as well. So those are really kind of some of the key lessons as I look back uh, over the last few years of what I took away and how the cloud helped me uh, get through this process and have you know, a, 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 a final exit that I was pretty happy with. Uh, but if I were to go do one more startup, um, so my first one didn't, uh, didn't go so well, but if I were gonna go do another startup, uh, a third try, I'd probably do a lot of the same things, but there's a few neat things that have come out since, uh, since I started the company that I might wanna look at. In terms of alerting, I probably wouldn't write my own watchdog process and use Twilio. No offense to Twilio, I love them, but there's a great service called PagerDuty that builds on top of Twilio and does all the things that we had plus more. And it's a great, great product. And so I would definitely use that. Data storage, I'd probably go beyond MySQL and look at NoSQL options, ideally hosted if I can, uh, because that wasn't my core business. Uh, subscriptions and billing, you know, we had to write a lot of the, uh, walk, the uh, shopping cart services, and I'd probably uh, have someone like Zuora or Chargefy or several other great companies uh, take care of that. Um, performance metrics, we, you know, we pretty much rigged our own system, and, uh, and I'd probably use things like CloudWatch, which now just recently, a few weeks ago, opened up custom metrics um, or, 
or something like RRD tool, which is a great way to do some time series data storage. Uh, Rackspace and GoGrid have scaled up greatly since I, last, uh, since I last looked at them back in 2008. There's plenty of other services I'd use. But uh, ultimately, I hope that this gives you some ideas of things you can do if you go and start a company and how the cloud can actually allow you to be maniacally focused on your next thing. Thank you so much.